Getting up close and intimate. Totally not taboo with Tracy. Celebrating sexual positivity both in and outside the bedroom. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Totally Not Taboo with Tracy. This is where we talk about everything taboo around sex and sexuality here on your media, hashtag where you are. So today we have a very, very, very exciting episode for you. We are talking to David Ross, all the way from Australia, about Sexpo. David is known worldwide as Mr. Sexpo. And i it's not really a beauty pageant um, title, although maybe he has won the title of beauty, you know, pageant title in his time. But um, I am very, very excited that he has agreed to join us. For us, it's morning. For him, it's the afternoon. And welcome, David. Thank you very much again. Good for taking morning time. to you, Tracy. Yes, you're right. It is good evening here, but um, well, 5.30 in the afternoon. So. Fabulous. So I have... Um, listen to many podcasts. I've seen you live. Um, recently, you spoke to spoke on Cliff Central. And um, you have a very colourful history. So would you like to give us your background and tell us how exactly you got into the industry? Well, colourful is a, a very flattering, flattering term. Um, look, uh, I was a motor mechanic by, uh, by trade. Um, many, many years ago, and um, I had a car accident uh, in 1980, on Christmas Day, actually, in 1980, which uh, resulted in a very long convalescing uh, period, and uh, as a result, I couldn't work as a motor mechanic any longer. So um, I uh, did what any red-blooded young bloke does, uh, and in, uh, invested his insurance policy, um, or some of his insurance uh, payout, into a brothel. Um, uh, uh, which was illegal at the time, but uh, there was a moratorium in place uh, and um, the, uh, the, the the business was going to become legal, should it meet certain criteria um, that uh, that I, I worked out it would fulfil. So I uh, happily wrote a cheque and uh, bought into that business and that was the beginning of my, uh, my experience with the adult industry. Uh, and... Um, it was uh, an interesting time, as I say, because it was illegal at the time. Um, it uh, it uh, it uh, attracted criminals by definition. <laughs> so, um, but then many years later, uh, once sex was started, uh, obviously that was uh, you know much more of a legitimate type business, and uh, and uh, Sexpo uh, has been Sexpo has been Sexpo ever since. Excellent, and. Um... <laughs> owning a brothel, what was that like? Well, I um, I actually used to do the cleaning um, there <laughs> at uh, some stages because I felt that I couldn't really participate in the business because you can't have a man, you know, work receptioning or or you know. So I really had uh, it was it was a it was a, I spent a lot of time uh, playing around with my friends and. Um, and uh, and really, it was an investment more than anything. And um, it did take me quite a few years to get my money back out of it. I might add uh, that uh, it's, uh, the people involved in it uh, were less than uh, forthcoming when it was time to sell out. But uh, we got a result in the end, and um, and that was the uh, the most important thing. But look, it was it was um, the, the, the the it was a great family atmosphere. It was a small place, six rooms, uh, and the legislation in Victoria is that that's the maximum you can only have six rooms um so it was a it was a small establishment and um only open originally from 9 a.m in the morning 10 a.m in the morning actually i think it was until 6 p.m at night five days a week what brothel have you ever heard that opens 10 a.m to 6 p.m five days a week but it was it was very busy uh catered to a a, a um a male clientele obviously um, but uh, it was um, uh, catered to a business uh, business clientele because it was right on the outskirts of Melbourne CBD, so Central mm. Business District. And um, it uh, it was it was a, it was a fun time, even though I wasn't involved in the you know at the 
front of house. So that was um, Sexpo started in what twenty? Uh, I mean nineteen. Um, Ninety six. Ninety six. So you were involved with the brothel for a very long time. So that's six. Oh no 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 no. no I um I I I I first became involved with the brothel in about eighty five. I think it was. Um, oh. and that was when the moratorium was announced. And I did a lot of research. I, I actually donned the suit and tie and went and knocked on neighbours' doors and said, are you aware of what's happening at the address? And they invariably would say no. So I quickly pulled out a pad and paper, and uh, which I had all the forms for. Would you, would you mind writing that down or signing this, saying you had no idea what was happening there, mm. uh, which helped us enormously when it came to the, uh, the legal um, case to get the permits. Um, mm. So I was there for so the, the eighty six I believe it was was when the um, the, the uh, legislation came into effect and we got our permit and I think it was probably eighty seven or eighty eight uh, that I got out of it um, and from there because um, I won't say well the the adult industry is my book is called um, Life Inside the Adult Industry Bubble. And mm. once you're in it, you, you get to know everyone else in it because mm. you socialise with people in the industry, you, you, you marry people in the industry, you, you, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's your life. Because mm. the, um, the, the, the discrimination that's, uh, that's put upon one by announcing that you're involved in the adult industry can be quite, uh, can be quite extreme. And so mm. it really is... Uh, very close knit community. So, by eighty eight, um, I got to know a lot of people in the industry, and by that stage, the industry was legal in Victoria. And I won't say that it had had uh, attracted a better uh, crowd of people, because really, most of the people that had the illegals places had all of a sudden become legitimate, uh, which was which was quite new to them, because uh, as I say, they had previously been criminals by definition. Um, <laughs> So I had learnt uh, a lot, uh, met a lot of people in the industry, and I always figured I had a bit of a, a thing for public relations and marketing. So mm. I took a course with the Australian Institute of Public Relations, um, and uh, and uh, and uh, then I started offering my services in marketing and public relations to the adult industry, particularly brothels in Melbourne, um, and some outside of Melbourne. And uh, so it wasn't long after that, well. Well, that, that was for several years, um, and then uh, and then at one stage I was approached by Club X, which is a chain of adult bookstores, uh, and they had a problem. Well, they had a perceived problem, and it was in fact a real problem that they weren't sending the right message to the female market. Um, you know, people may remember people of a certain age uh, may remember that. Um, Adult shops years ago used to be pretty dark and dingy sort of places. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's the same in South Africa, but mm. it was often joked about the raincoat brigade hanging out at, at <laughs> adult retail stores. And that was pretty much what it was like. And so I took on the, I was approached by Club X and, uh, and I think it took 12 months to negotiate a contract. You know, it was a lot of lunches involved. I remember that. Okay. Um, and the brief, in short, was that uh, they wanted to improve their image amongst women because women really are the major purchaser of hard product being, you know, uh, vibrators, um, dildos, you know, and so forth. Whereas men at the time, and this is going back a few years, men at the time were wearing, uh, were, um, were uh, buying DVDs. So they were big purchasers mm -hmm. of movies. Women were buying the product. But mm -hmm. the problem was that there wasn't enough of them coming into the stores. So the brief was to um, change the public's perception, in particular particular women, perception mm. of adult retail stores. So I uh, took the contract and um, and then look, did all the normal PR things, did a lot of media, open days, sausage sizzles, a sausage sizzle for a new store, which was really quite amazing because no one got the joke, and uh, strangely enough, we couldn't give away a sausage. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, so a lot of people didn't get the joke there actually. So um, so 
some months into the contract, it became apparent to me by touring some of the stores, both in, in Melbourne and around the state and the country, mm. um, that it didn't matter what I did in regard to public relations. I could tell the public anything they wanted to hear, mm. but once they got into the stores, they were still going to see the, 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 the dark and dingy place that, uh, that, uh, that uh, one would have imagined they'd see when they walk in. So it, uh, it came to me that, uh, well, I saw actually a, um, a lady give a speech, Susan Colvin from California Exotic Novelties. And she was, um, she, I, had a, I, had a, I had a freelance journalist at my desk at the office. And uh, one of uh, the Club X uh, people walked past and said, well, are you coming to this lunch? And I had no idea about it. So there was a, a, a trade day and Susan Colvin from California Exotic Novelties was giving a presentation. And I took along this freelance journalist mm. and we were sitting down in this, um, this restaurant and there was probably 60 or 80 people there, white tablecloths, champagne, wine on the tables. And in the middle of the table, there'd be a, a, an artificial vagina or, you know, a big dildo or a vibrator or something. And Susan would be up the front and she'd be saying, this fits, you know, this is uh, fits on so-and-so shelving system. It's recommended retail is this, pick it up, have a feel of it. You know, we can, we're taking orders later. And everyone was sitting around very matter-of-factly, you know, picking up these things and playing and going, oh, that's, isn't that lovely? And that will fit on my racking system. And it was also a matter-of-fact and business-like. And the, the white tablecloths and the champagne and in a, in a familiar uh, setting being a restaurant, um, I went away from that night and three o'clock in the morning or something the next day, which is when all good ideas come to one apparently, um, I realized that we needed, you know, rather than try and beat my head against the wall and try and convince the public that, uh, that, um, you know, it was safe to come into a club X store and everything was hunky dory and they were female mm. friendly. I thought it's probably better to take the, the product out of the store, mm. put it into an environment like the restaurant that people were, mm. were comfortable going to. So initially. Uh, initially, it was um, it was trying to find a, a, an establishment that would um, that would uh, suit, and uh, and uh, originally it was going to be a two day touch and feel it. Uh, mm. Yes, and then it turned into something bigger. But I just am interested. I'm loving the story, and I'm going to um, we're going to get to the expansion into this expo. But what is very intriguing for me is your open-mindedness and your attitude, obviously, towards um, the you know opening the brothel and um, your just your general um, attitude towards sex toys and the sex industry. Were you always so open-minded? What got you into um, this kind of? Uh, open-minded. I'm not quite sure what else, that what other word um, at this moment is it's escaping me. Well, there, there's there's some things that um, that I won't go into now uh, mm. about my past that are somewhat more colourful than uh, than uh, I've previously mentioned. But um, look, when I found myself as a broken down motor mechanic um, <laughs> with uh, with severe physical injuries. Um, it, uh, it really was a matter of sink or swim because uh, I was, I left school relatively early or very early um, and uh, I had, uh, had nothing else uh, on, the, on, the, on the table that was, uh, was make, make some money or, or, or spend the insurance payout and then end up on the dole. Um, so I suppose that gave me an entrepreneurial flair, flair um, right from the outset where one needs to produce or um or not and uh, the not part was not something that was very palatable to me um as i say I, I go i go into detail about my years prior to sexpo in the book but um mm. i i really don't want to um uh to delve into them but it, suffice to say uh colorful would be an, a nice word and uh not always on the right side of the law Mm. No, I get that completely. Um, just then, all I can say is working as a sex therapist and really kind of feeling um, quite empowered as a woman 
to be able to educate other women um, in terms of emancipation and using toys in the bedroom and trying to help couples spice up their relationship. Um, it's, it's lovely to hear a man who is so, um, so free and free-spirited and open to educating the masses too. So what I love about the Sexpo is the opportunity that you provided to the masses to mm. explore beyond the boundaries of such taboo. So what I'm also very, very interested in is the taboo around Sexpo. And I'm sure that you did encounter so many obstacles, uh, legally, um, socially. I'm sh so can you tell me more about the taboos that you encountered? Absolutely. And look, the taboos, uh, go on to this day, uh, and the discrimination yes. goes on to this day. In fact, I'm doing a bit of uh, work with um, with uh, people from the adult industry uh, that uh, that are finding themselves discriminated against from banks and um, lenders and uh, real estate agents. It, you know, it, it goes on and on. But when it comes to um, sexpo, right from the word go, when um, mm -hmm. when uh, I decided this is what we needed to do. I, of course, went about finding a venue. And as I said, the original plan was to it was going to be a two-day touch and feel expo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, and uh, and so <laughs> the idea was that we were going to hold this on a, on a Friday, and, sorry, a Saturday and a Sunday in a, a small reception area of a hotel, um, some white tablecloths, hence harking back to the idea from the restaurant, um, some white tablecloths, some product and people there explaining to people what the product did, let them touch it and feel it. And, um, and it, uh, it, it, that, that's, that's where it started. And going about trying to find a venue, look, imagine trying to walk around or ring and try to get appointments to see uh, venue managers and say, I'd like to put a whole lot of dildos on display in your conference mm. area uh, mm. and invite the public in to come and touch and feel them. How do you feel about that? Well, mm. you can imagine what the response was. And I think, um, look, it's going back a long way now, but I believe that it took me a good six months uh, of, uh, of uh, looking for a venue, mm. knockback after knockback, um, and, um, and, uh, and it just it did, it became very much of a grind. In the meantime, the word had got out in the adult industry that this is what we were planning. And so I was getting phone calls from people saying, can I have a stand? And can I have a booth? And on the booth, we were just going to have tables. You know? So, so this and maybe the the problem with the venue helped us because by the time we actually found a venue, we'd we'd almost sold out all the stands. And the, I think there was only twenty five stands at the first show. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was doing everything from you know drawing a floor plan to selling, and I had um, I used to walk around with a floor plan in my pocket. So when people rang me and they say, oh, can I book a stand at the show? And I'd pull out and yep, that one's still available, no problems. And I, there was one lady um, who, uh, who uh, will remain nameless for the moment, but um, she was wanting to throw money at, you know, for the stand. And I said, look, I don't know what they're going to cost at the moment because I'd never been in event management before. Uh, mm -hmm. And I had to still do all the costing of working out how much we needed to charge for these stands. And originally it was, oh, look, it might be $500. And then after doing a bit more work, it might be a thousand dollars. And I think by the first, the time we did the first show, that the stands cost eighteen hundred dollars each. So it was a long way short, a long way from the five hundred that I had initially anticipated. So look, mm. it was really learning on the fly. Mm. And um, so, but the discrimination you met, you to your point or your question. Um, so, so the original thing, trying to find a small venue, and then. Uh, we found the Carlton Crest Hotel in um, Queens Road in Melbourne, which was pretty suited to what we wanted. And um, we said that uh, we told the media afterwards that we did 5,000 people. The truth of the matter is, we really don't know how many people we did. Uh, I suspect mm. it was more like 3,000. But it was enough to tell us that we had, you know, this was more than a two day touch and feel expo because we had, by the, by the time it had got to this stage, there was a stage involved. And for people that are listening, uh, watching, that have been to Sexpo more recently, they may be very surprised to hear that 
the first show had a, a stage that was just one riser, like eight mm -hmm. inches. I think. Um, we were playing the music for the, the performers through a cassette player where someone <laughs> went and kept going, push the cassette player. And we had, we had, we had a little um, uh, display next to the stage with next performance on, which was done with cut out letters that we could play. So, you know, next. <laughs> this is a true story. This is a true story. So, this was 1996, uh, October mm. of 1996. <laughs> and, um, and we certainly we worked out very quickly that uh, gee, maybe we've got some business on our. Mm. It was originally a public relations exercise. And all of a sudden, we thought we might have a business on our hands here. And um, so we went to Sydney and did a show in February, I believe it was, um, February or March, uh, at the, um, mm. in King's Cross um, at the Gazebo oh, Hotel. Oh, wow. Yes. Now, from a public relations point of view, that was probably, I was very still pretty green at the time. And looking back at it, I'm thinking, why would I go and put a show where I'm trying to clean up the industry in, <laughs> in King's Cross at the Gazebo Hotel, which is a pokey, I mean, lovely hotel, I'm sure. Um, but it, it probably wasn't the look we're after. So that, that show was actually really quite successful too. Um, and, you know, no car parking. It was public transport issues. It was really quite amazing that people found their way there. So then it came to, and this goes back to the discrimination point. And I, I won't digress mm. too much, but um, mm. but um, but so with the uh, trying to, f we, we realised we had a, a business on our hands, and uh, so then I went looking for uh, a more suitable venue, and uh, and the Melbourne Exhibition Centre came to mind, and that's of course the major exhibition centre in um, in uh, Melbourne, and uh, one of the biggest in the country. Mm. Well. You can probably imagine the response. <laughs> so I then went back to them with a different voice and said, we'd like to book it. And I, this is when we came out with the Health, Sexuality and Lifestyle Expo tag. Yes. And so yes. I said, we'd like to hold a Health, Sexuality and Lifestyle Expo. Can I come and Love see it. you? Uh. So once again, the suit goes on and I go down to the Melbourne Exhibition Centre. Yes, that's great. It sounds fantastic. You know, here's some dates. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And so... And the, the, the exact um, time that I told them escapes me, but at some stage I mentioned that actually the show was called Sexpo, Health, Sexuality and Lifestyle Expo. Well, <laughs> well, no, uh, that wasn't going to yeah. suit the Melbourne Exhibition Center at all. And they made up, the, the, the excuse was that the dates had become available uh, all of a sudden because there was an accountant seminar at the same time. <laughs> and um, so I sort of had my nose a bit out of joint by the stage. And, you know, as I said, previous experience uh, outside of Sexpo uh, gave me mm. some sort of uh, inkling about how to deal with such uh, recalcitrant people. And that is to go on the attack. And uh, so I, um, I, uh, I put out a media release saying clearly accountants don't have sex and they are as boring as they, uh, as they uh, <laughs> are told that everyone tells they are because okay. Melbourne experts don't won't take out booking. Now, that, that really got us some great publicity and we were selling hands, stands hand over fist when we didn't have a venue yet. <laughs> and so I put together a, a, a two or three minute reel video back in the day uh, of footage we'd taken from the show in 1996. And I put that into a, a, a montage and put together a glossy brochure and wrote all the nice words about how we were, you know, sort of, open to all sexualities and we were presenting health information and this, that, and the other. And I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm doing a bit of public speaking uh, at the moment and the name of the show is, um, the name of the presentation is, you, 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 uh, you can't polish a turd, but you, can oh, certainly, love that. but you can certainly roll it in glitter. And that's exactly what happened here is we rolled the turd in glitter um and uh, and made it presentable to the public and it was a nice shiny lovely thing oh isn't that beautiful i mean the true idea was to sell adult product but we had lingerie we had health information and i'm not saying that i'm opposed to health information by any stretch but it what it, I, i'm not completely benevolent <laughs> it was because we used to give these stands away to the health people um it was a, it was the idea of the they were the glitter you know? uh, spa bars and so forth 
So I put together this tape for the MEC and, um, and then um, I went about uh, gate crashing a boardroom meeting and uh, I took a 12 pack of, uh, of these presentation folders and videos down and I waited outside the uh, Melbourne Exhibition Centre um, board meeting and waited for all the board members to come out and once again dressed in a suit and tie and a you know, nice haircut and had a bit more hair then than I do now <laughs> uh, and um, and presented them with this pack and told them who I was and what was going on and after many more phone calls and much more lobbying we ended up getting they ended up coming to the party and um, and uh, so you know that was fantastic and the, the first show we only had three thousand square meters and I designed the floor plan to soak up space because I thought 3,000 metres was too big. Well, when we opened the door, 39,800 people attended over the four days. My goodness. This is up from 3,000 we'd done the year before wow. at the Carlton Press. And it was just, we were wringing our hands going, what are we doing here? We had a lineup that went all the way from one end, because of course the mm. Melbourne Exhibition Centre, and this gets back to your point about discrimination, they mm. would take our money, but they put us right at the end of the venue away from prying eyes so fortunately they did in hindsight because the the queue went four wide all the way up the concourse which is a kilometer uh up the con and down out the front doors and down the steps into the into Clarendon street um and i thought i thought we've blown this no one's going to come back next year i've had to wait mm. line for two hours you know, uh, and, and then get in and it was so busy so packed that that you know people were walking around and the only way staff could get through the, the crowd was to take an empty box and walk through the crowd with an empty box to say, you know, <laughs> coming through. So, but, and once again, I, I digress a little, but um, the uh, the point being that the uh, Melbourne Exhibition Centre uh, general manager came up to me at one stage when this queue was a mile long or kilometre long. Mm. And he said, David, you know, I'm glad you've convinced us. Well, he wasn't quite so uh, forthcoming, but um, words to the effect of, <laughs> I'm glad we had the show here in the end. You've really won me over now. I just saw my neighbour in the queue. So <laughs> this goes to the point of, once again, the discrimination where everyone does it. You know? Your yes. mother and your father did it. That's why you're here. My mother and my father. Did it. You know, people have sex. They People enjoy it. Um, yeah. And some people do it for uh, the purpose of uh, procreation. Um, but, but you know, mention it in a business environment. And it's like, oh no, oh no, we can't have any of that. And it's just, it, it still confounds me to this day that that's the case. You know? But yeah. it goes yeah. on to this day. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So that's exactly what I was um, thinking about. You know, it's sex is still taboo. And as much as we think that we're living in a modern society that has evolved and, um, you know, I know certainly that Sexpo in South Africa and Johannesburg at Nazareth was massive and they, you know, it was packed out and um, it was a really fabulous event. There, there is still um, this, um, sh this cloud above sex and sexuality. It's still not really spoken about and it's very under undercover. So, it seems that some things have changed and yet some things have not changed. And as you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, you looked at these financiers and these accountants and lawyers and you thought, really, do you guys not have sex? Do you not have kinks? Yeah. You know, and it is, it's ridiculous. Of course they do. What is this element that people are so um, offended by? when it comes well, to sex and toys and this kind of thing? Tracy, if, uh, if I knew that, um, then, uh, well, I'd, uh, I'd be a lot smarter than I am. Um, look, I, I really don't know. I mean, it seems, I mean, someone's asked me if I felt any sort of um, pride in, in having brought sex back to the market. And I do, um, uh, because it seems the general public have, um, have become a lot more open about the topic. Um, by sheer numbers, uh, demonstrated by sheer numbers coming through the door, as you mentioned, uh, in South Africa, numbers were even better per head, uh, per, uh, per capita, um, than Australia. Uh, it, you know, South Africa was a marvellous success for us. Um, so, 
the general public vote with their feet by coming to the show. But a lot of it, and it goes back to the meeting I had with the um, the venue in 1996 after the show, after the successful mm. show where we did somewhere between three and 5,000 people, mm. uh, and, uh, and met with the general manager of the venue on the Monday and said, okay, let's book for next year. And he said, David, you know, it won't be happening next year at this venue. Mm. And and now he did us a favour in the end because that pushed me to go and uh, lobby the MEC and get the MEC in the end. But yeah. I would have I would have made that booking there and then sitting with him uh, and we would have been stuck for another year in a small venue and, you know, but he did us a favour. But the mm. reason he, he gave was that um, was that, uh, that the, the Catholic Church had been on the phone to him and said, if this show, is, you show that show again, we will mm. take all our business out. And the Catholic Church have conventions and you know lunches and whatever book hotel rooms, and they he he I said I actually took down a note while I was speaking to him. I said so you're saying the Catholic Church you know, said they won't, have, and uh, and of course I used that in media release later on as well. Mm. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, so the the church, uh, and I'm a committed atheist. I'll I'll put that out there. Um, yeah. I believe in science, um, but. The church have a lot to answer for in regard to suppression of, uh, of people's attitudes mm-hmm. towards sex, you know, or the changing of, that, of people's attitudes towards sex. However, the majority of people, uh, it seems, or the, 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 the large amount of people that have uh, defied those uh, edicts by the church um, are, uh, are voting with their feet coming to sex vote, but the church persists and they have a lot of sway over businesses. And um, I'm sorry if I sound anti-religious, but um, it, that they're the bane of they're the bane of the adult industry's life. Absolutely, I agree, and um, I see a lot of the effects of religious dogma on my clients and um, the consequences of that uh, the religious ethics values on couples and their relationships towards mm. sex and within their relationships, as I said. And it's a real pity because there's also seems to be a changing trend within religious institutions to teach about you know, different kind of sex education these days, although we still do have um, quite, you know, the other side of uh, the extremist, extremists who are still teaching the same kind of... Um, stringent laws around sex and sexuality mm. but we are starting to see some kind of more open-mindedness um yeah so there was another um kind of point that i wanted to touch on with you and that was around um so firstly i think that what you have done for the market is sex market the uh, exposure to toys and being okay around play is absolutely amazing how Mm. come the south african market was more receptive and than the australian market well i may have um i may have misspoken uh when i said that that per capita uh, south africa was uh, more popular than australia but um i would say um and you know i don't have the figures right in front of me but i would say that uh, it, it certainly is on a par so I correct myself and say it's on a par. Um, and the funny thing is that you know I've done a lot of media in South Africa over the years, and mm. um, and numerous journalists have said to me, "Yo, know, oh, David, it's, you know we're all very uh, we're all very uh, sort of uh, conservative over here. I don't know how you're going to go." And and what happened? <laughs> South Africans, thank you very much. Turned up in your droves, mm. and I believe what it is is that is that. You know the media, the mainstream media, in in most part, try and instill this fear. You know, and let's be honest about this: that a lot of the media money comes from uh, advertising, from business, businesses that are associated with with religion, um, and uh, and everyone's afraid of upsetting the religious. Mm. Uh, and yet, you know, you look at the numbers, and, mm. and it doesn't doesn't ring true. But anyway. So all these journalists would say to me, oh, David, how do you think you're going to go? We're all very conservative over here. And I say, proof is in the pudding. Um, and mm. I would say in answer that everyone I met in South Africa uh, and every time I'm in South Africa, I'm, I'm, 
I believe that people are more open to discussing the subject uh, and more open about their behaviour um, than than those in Australia. Mm. And so I think I've got a bit of a theory that the, the mainstream media, for whatever reason, whether it's the religion or whatever it is, but the mainstream media are trying to tell people that they're conservative, but that doesn't make it so. You know? Just because mm. they print something on the front page of the newspaper, which should be an opinion piece, um, it doesn't make it so. And so if anyone can say, oh, if South Africans are so so conservative, you know, they'll never talk about sex, they'll never stand in line next to someone going into a show like that, well, rubbish. Agreed. And completely agreeable um, because I'm seeing so many more people who are open to the idea of a whole range of, as I say, play, sexual play, um, from P BDSM to swinging to um, all types of kinks and couples really wanting to spark up their sex lives. Um, a lot of people here in South Africa, youngsters, are a lot more open to talking about sex, their, their issues that they're having around sex, um, and also the demographic for us here in South Africa. A lot of young black people are so open with their changing ideas, their changing needs in their relationships. Um, they're being far more vocal with what they want from their partners. And um, this is also challenging a little bit of cultural views, cultural opinions, religious opinions. Um, white South Africans are still a little bit stuck, conservative, yeah. but the youngsters are still very much wanting to explore more and more willing to talk about their needs. And their sexuality. Well, I hope I've been. Um, I hope I was in some part responsible for that you know, over there in South Africa. Um, I, I'm very, very sure you have, and especially this brings me to the point of um, Soweto Sexpo. I'm sure you're aware that this was taking place, Soweto Sexpo. Uh, I have Sex Expo, is it? Um, yes, it's Soweto. You know, Soweto yeah. is a yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But, it's, but, it, but I think it's called Love the Sex Expo, isn't it? So there are two. So Soweto Expo was taking place, I think it was in 2018. Right. Um, I'm not quite sure how long it ran for. I think it was 2018 and 2019. Um, or 2020, yes. Sex, uh, Soweto Sex Expo was 2020. No, I think it was cancelled because of um, COVID. Yeah. COVID. Um, because I was looking for a sexpo and I came across this Soweto sexpo. And then well, we were actually... So just, to, just to clarify that, so it's, mm. it, it's sex expo. So um, the, oh. the, the term sexpo is trademarked and, um, and uh, is protected by you know, international conventions. Um, so uh, I, I would be... Uh, uh, not that I'm any longer involved in the business. Um, mm. However... I think in 2018, no, I probably was already out. Um, but it used to be a lot of my job to keep an eye on trademark infringements um, because everyone, man and his dog, thought that uh, thought they could run a show and call it sex work. Mm. And, you know, it was another real indication of how successful we'd been uh, with branding in that, um, you know, just like Hoover has become a term for vacuuming, um, mm. you know, uh, Coke has become a term for, you know, soda or, yeah, you know, mm. it, it seemed that everyone just understood or thought that they could have a sex expo and call it sexpo. Mm. So we used to spend, uh, I used to spend uh, quite a lot of time um, in discussions with our trademark attorneys mm. um, dealing with such matters. Um, you know, not, uh, I don't think I ever had one in South Africa, um, but, you know, America was a, America was a, a prime candidate. They were, they just thought that they could run the Sex bow and it was okay. We'd write them a nice letter to start with. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. We did actually have. We we did have one. Uh, we got to court in one instance in the US and and won. Um, so anyway, that, so just that's I digress. But uh, yeah, so that that was uh, called love the sex act. But an interesting story about that um, is that the the, the lady behind that uh, that show is mm. the sister and who actually worked at Sexpo in the early years um, 
uh, when it was Sexpo. Uh, and um, she um, she is the sister of uh, the gentleman who I did the license agreement with. Uh, and um, we were in talks to, and then, then they sold the look. But, <laughs> If anyone's thinking about wants to run a sex over there, let yes. me know. I can broker a deal for you. Um, but uh, but success by, sex by the brand was so successful uh, in South Africa that two years after signing the license agreement, um, the license was on sold for more than two million Australian dollars. Wow. Two years That's these okay. people ran for, sold it for over two million Australian dollars. Uh, that licensee then went on to run it for another eight or nine years, it was on sold again, uh, amount undisclosed. Um, and uh, and then of course the last licensee, unfortunately had some issues out at Nazareth with um, for the soccer game and put him under enormous, mm. fi uh, enormous financial pressure. Of course, uh, head office in Australia, we wanted our uh, pound of flesh um, because obviously you can't use the brand for nothing. Uh, and um, that was the last show really. Oh, sorry, no, he tried to run one at Santon in, early 2017 and um and uh and that was a failure due to his urgency in getting a show on picking mm. the wrong dates but uh, but the sex expo I love the sex expo um mm. look it, it's uh, it's um it's just unfortunate they can't uh, they chose not to uh, to engage us and, and call it sex expo because um the brand in South Africa, having been run for 10 years, is very strong. And, and um, love the sex expo, I'm afraid, just uh, doesn't, doesn't, people are still calling it sex expo, as you, as even mm, you were. Mm, um, mm. Love the sex expo, it just doesn't, it doesn't have a ring to it, I'm afraid. Mm. So, David, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to run a similar kind of expo? Because it's so completely needed. Um, also from a health education, from a sexual health educational um, perspective, because we're very, very much into sexual health at the moment. Um, I myself am very involved on quite a few platforms. Um, it's very important to educate the public about sexual health. So what, um, what advice well, would I mean, you give? I strongly encourage anyone listening um, to get in contact with me um, because I've, I've spoken to the uh, current owners of the trademark um, uh, based in Australia, and um, they're certainly open to uh, to doing a deal to uh, to uh, relaunch in South Africa. And I think starting from scratch, I mean, there's no point in trying to reinvent the wheel. Sexpo is such a strong brand, mm. um, and for the small amount of uh, of, uh, of money uh, payable to use the brand it seems really pointless to me to try and start an exhibition called something else when you've got 10 years of history um so i would uh, say if anyone uh, is interested in running an exhibition uh, of an adult nature contact me and i can put you in contact with the uh, the uh, the trademark owners because they'd love to have sex mode back in south africa yeah um i think that we really really need that as a as a country was as a city um, yeah, we could take it to Durban, Cape Town. I think that that would be absolutely vital. Um, definitely continuing the education and um, letting go of the taboo of sex. Hmm. Uh, and uh, look, I mean, you know, pardon me for getting a bit of a plug in here, but I did mention to you before um, about the, uh, the the more salacious uh, parts that will be included in the book. And I would also encourage anyone to um, that's interested in... Uh, in, uh, in getting a pre uh, advanced copy of the book or mm. getting an invite to a launch party. As soon as the COVID business is done and dusted, um, yes. I'll be doing a speaking tour of South Africa and uh, and uh, also conducting launch parties for the book. Mm. Uh, so if anyone's interested in, uh, in uh, well, they can book me for a speaking gig as well, of mm. course, but, um, but if anyone's interested uh, in uh, getting a, an invite to an, a launch party ticket um, or um, or an advanced copy of the book, they should go to the Mr. Web, Mr. Sexpo website, which is uh, Mr. Hyphen Dash Sexpo dot com, uh, and um, and they'll be first in line. Oh, I'm so excited about that! So, when are you planning to get to South Africa to launch your well, book? Um, it really, our borders are just opening up now, um, uh, and uh, but 
I believe I'm not sure what the current situation in South Africa is, but I look I'd be looking at somewhere middle of next year, I think, um, because uh, there's quite a bit of planning involved to uh, to get all the, the speaking engagements uh, done and dusted. Uh, and my agent's looking at that now, but um, but uh, we um, and we've got plus we've got to work out in with what's happening in here in Australia. So um, so, but I would hope to think that uh, we could do it by middle of next year. Are you ready for the onslaught of publicity and your talks, your your um, media presentations, and the demand for you? Are you ready for it? Well, I'm sort of uh, living a fairly quiet life these days, so um, um, apart from the odd gig and plus writing my book. Um, so I, uh, look, I sort of semi-retired and thought oh, it'd be nice to live on the coast and by the water and so uh, it has become a little bit too quiet. Um, so <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to getting my teeth back into, uh, into, um, into something a bit, uh, you know, marketing PR, which I'm handling the marketing and PR for, my, for the book and, uh, and this book. My agent's looking after the speaking, um, but I'm looking for after the PR for the uh, marketing and PR for the book, um, and uh, and I'm enjoying, you know, doing that rather than just tapping away at the keyboard. You know, well, mm. I won't say eight hours a day because I'm not tapping away eight hours a day. But <laughs> <laughs> the writing of an autobiography, anyone's ever done it, it's it it can be a painful process. Well, it is a painful process, mm. and, and it throws up all number of. Um, uh, emotions and memories uh that um is is it's 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 a it's a real anyone anyone that's written an autobiography i take my hat off to you mm. yeah well i've tried uh, my hand at writing a book as well and um it's got as far as writing an outline <laughs> and doing some research and i will do it eventually one day um well, david yeah no, no, I, 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 it's, 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 it's. I keep saying to people, it's a long and sl a slow, tedious process. Um, but uh, it's, I, I, some have said it's like giving birth, you know. Um, okay. And um, I can't speak to that, but, uh, but I have seen my uh, darling ex-wife uh, give birth, and um, it uh, looks pretty familiar to me. <laughs> I agree. There's just one last thing, unless you know you want to share something else as well, is. Um, Talking about people in the industry and their long-standing um, experience, well, long-standing stay in the industry, you said that it can be quite taxing on these um, people and the discrimination that they face being in the industry in terms of getting employment and so on. And um, so you said that they should have a plan B. Most definitely. I mean... Um, uh, people that have been in the industry, and look, I actually, um, I actually uh, toyed with the idea of uh, of going and getting a job um, outside of the adult industry a couple of years ago, because you know, I was starting to get a bit bored, um, mm. and uh, and so I toyed with that idea, and so I put together a resume, which mm. you know it was um, fairly uh, descriptive of what I'd done in the past, and um, uh, and uh, and guess what, you know. No takers. It, it reminded me of um, of a um, a movie that uh, had um, had uh, Bruce. Uh, anyway, the name escapes me. But um, but uh, but uh, fun with Dick and Jane. It was called. Um, and um, and where the, the 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 lead role the man, you know, did something dodgy, and uh, he had to go and find another job. And he'd go to interviews and think he he was in with a chance. And I say, oh no, we don't want to employ you. you know, we just want to hear the stories. <laughs> and so it reminded me. So that like that that idea of finding a job outside the adult industry lasted about five minutes. I, mean, no, I think uh -huh. I think I sent my resume out to maybe half a dozen people, maybe a dozen. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, yeah. and uh, and then it became quickly apparent that that wasn't uh, that wasn't the, the way forward. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've had to entertain myself in other ways. Um, <laughs> so yes, look, people need a plan B and. Particularly, a lot of people that are that are entertainers um, that are not in the business side of the business. I mean, they're running their own business, so they are in business. Mm. But that's got a shelf life, you know? and mm. and, um, and, uh, and it's most important most important to get the finances in order early on when 
it's all beer and skittles the front money's coming in and it's all beautiful but when the shelf life starts to get towards its expiry date uh that money can dry up very quickly and i can only imagine um someone who's been in the front line of the animal industry uh or yeah, as an entertainer uh, i mean what do they put on their resume yeah? what what how do they so they need to be self-sufficient they need to set themselves up right for word go mm -hmm. and so i have actually uh i have actually teamed up with some financial advisors here in australia who are, are adult industry friendly um because people in the adult industry you know they've often worked you know multiple jobs pre prior to going in the industry um you know single parent a lot and they they can be a little jaded by the experience of being in the adult industry and the and the type of discrimination they've uh, they've suffered and so it's most important when you're trying to deal with people that have been jaded is to make sure they trust you and um mm. you know I mean, the people that I've selected uh, to do that are, uh, are well uh, well regarded and they've got a good attitude towards the adult industry. So, you know, mm. and when we haven't uh, done this in South Africa yet, but if there's a demand, I'll certainly look at it. Um, but um, but uh, it's, it's I would say to anyone that's listening, watching, um, if you're in the adult industry, you know, it, it's, it's not going to last forever unless yeah. you, you know, start a business that can employ other people. Um, mm. But uh, you need to you need to make sure your finances are in order. Mm. Um, yes, I absolutely agree. And it's just so ironic that Sexpo, well, um, this industry is really aimed at women, for women, uh, the opportunity for them to feel safe. And I'm talking about Sexpo, and that's why you started it, really. Um, an opportunity for them to explore their sexuality and to make sure that it's it is an environment for women to get their men there as well mm -hmm. um, and that it's driven by women and yet the majority of women in the adult industry the majority of people in the ad adult industry are women yes, and they're the ones true. who are discriminated yeah, mostly that, that, that is that is an unfortunate mm. truth um and yeah. uh, and as i say it, that's well that's not why but that is an unfortunate truth uh so but it doesn't matter you know um you know male female or other um mm. uh, and you know there's a lot of transgender people working in the industry mm. too um yeah and uh, and so you know once again combine the discrimination that transgender people suffer mm. uh, combined with the fact that if they've worked in the adult industry, you know, really. Oh, so, um, so look, I, you know, in closing, I think that that's, uh, that's, you know, if anyone's got a takeaway from this is it's all good and well to, uh, to, uh, have the public on your side, mm. um, and, uh, and, uh, be supportive of the industry. But when it comes to dealing with the business, um, you know, businesses are all too keen because not all, too keen, all too reticent to, to, to be seen to be supporting the adult industry because they think it's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, they think that the general public will boycott them if they're seen to be supporting the adult industry. Nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. So the point being is in closing, I say um, that uh, the people must uh, must make sure that they um, they uh, they start their their journey uh, towards financial security very early on. Because no one else is, no one's coming for you. You know, they need to make sure they're, they're looking after themselves. Hundred um, percent. One last thing: Does sex sell? Well, look. I mean, I think um, I've often joked that uh, that I can't take much credit for uh, for the you know tens of thousands of people that would show up to each show. Because if I couldn't uh, if I couldn't get a crowd into a show called Sexpo, um, then uh, then I need to be looking at my marketing credentials. So I would say that um, that look, uh, in sex vote or sex in general uh, is certainly a marketable commodity, but it certainly needs to be done in a nuanced way. Um, and I think uh, fortunately we got that right. David, thank you, thank you, thank you again for your time. I've enjoyed this chat so much, and um, I know that our audience, our listeners, our viewers are going to get so much information from you and we're looking so forward 
to the launch of your book so that we can get more of the nitty gritty behind the man and behind the events. And um, I'm very looking forward to meeting you, hopefully, and to getting yes. your book. And um, it's really been an honor for me to interview well, you. And I really, really appreciate your time. So thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, Tracy. And I uh, thank you very much. And uh, I once again just encourage people to pop off the Mr. Sexpo website uh, if they want to, if they, because not so much the, the, the book, uh, uh, because Obviously, if they're not interested in a pre uh, pre um, uh, advanced copy, then that's fine. But uh, the invitation to the launch parties will only be available to people who have registered on the uh, website. So Brilliant. thank you once again, and thank you to you too, and have a lovely, lovely evening. Yeah.